let's go to our bar intention again. So I'm going to have a bar of length L and cross-sectional area A, and I'm going to apply a load P to it. And when I apply that load P, the bar grows by an amount delta, and it decreases in diameter, so the cross-sectional area shrinks a little bit. And what we saw for many materials, if I plot load versus displacement, I get a, I get a straight line. And that straight line is for this given cross-sectional area that I've uh, drawn right here. Take a larger cross-sectional area, we get a steeper curve. In a smaller cross-section area, we get a shallower curve. And likewise, if we discuss the load versus displacement curve for different lengths, we also get a lot of different lines. So the way we discuss normalizing these effects out were to not use load and displacement, but stress and strain. And so when I generate the same plot, but now rather than plotting load, I plot load divided by area for these three experiments, they all follow the same curve. And likewise, if I use different lengths, those would also fall in the same curve. So for a given material, if I plot stress versus strain, all the experiments collapse to a single curve, and the slope of the line here is called E, the elastic modulus or Young's modulus. Of course, this is true for a linear elastic material, and as we saw, things can happen at some point where this curve is no longer linear. But we saw for many materials, at least when the deflections and the loads are relatively small, that this straight line approximation is pretty good. So the linear relationship between stress and strain is known as Hooke's Law. And it's often written in different ways. So this is the most general form, and we'll actually generalize this even further uh, later in the course. A way this is often written for a bar in tension is written as the stress as being force over area, the strain being the displacement over the length, and then this just being rearranged to give us that the deflection is PL over EA. So for a bar intention, if I want to know the deflection, I use this formula. This formula. And we see the analogy to Hooke's Law because now it's telling us that the displacement and the force are linearly related, and this term here is kind of acting like the spring constant. So Hooke's Law is named after Robert Hooke, who lived between 1635 and 1703. So Hooke was a contemporary of Newton and quite a famous scientist. Uh, the fact is, though, he and Newton didn't get along very well, so they have kind of an interesting history, which you can read about on your own. But Hooke was quite an accomplished scientist, worked in a number of different fields. Uh, some of his most famous work had to do with drawings made by uh, early microscopes, which he made. Um, but his work in mechanics, he first published his law that we now call Hooke's Law as an anagram, C-E-I-I-N-O-S-S, -S, so on, so on, so on, which stood for this phrase here, which is translated as the extension, so the force. Apparently, it was common uh, to publish a result early as an anagram to establish priority that was your idea maybe while you were still working on it, not ready to quite publish your final result, but you kind of leak some information out so that way if someone claims to invented it after you, uh, you can come back and claim priority. So let's go back to our stress-strain curve. Again, we saw a number of materials that would give us behavior that looks like the one I've sketched here. So our linear elastic range is only gonna be up to this point here. So it's interesting to think for different materials, if I pull this thing up until it yields, how much strain is there actually, right? So if I take a steel bar and I pull it until just it starts to deform permanently, or even up until it breaks, how much could I expect it to deform? So the concept of yield strain, we can see on this diagram that we looked at before. So we're here, we're plotting Young's modulus versus strength for different classes of materials. And so the yield strain is given by the ratio of these two quantities. So right here is the value of 10 to the minus four. So any material along this line, if I pull it until it yields, the strain at that point would be 10 to the minus four. Meaning if I had a one meter bar, it would have only strained by 0 0.1 millimeters. So things like stone uh, fall in that category. If I follow this line here, 10 to the minus three, 
meaning if I have one meter of material, I get one millimeter of deformation before it breaks. Uh, you see that passes kind of right through the middle of the metal. So that might be typical of what we would see in a steel bar. If I take a steel bar and I start pulling on it till it breaks, it might deform about a millimeter before it snaps. Um, here's 10 to the minus two, meaning our one meter bar would deform one centimeter. So this passes through a number of foams, polymers, and then also uh, several metals here as well. But you see the metals here uh, typically are things that you might consider being softer metals. Um, so more deformation kind of makes sense. If we go even further, here's 10 to the minus one, or if we're passing along, uh, it's not drawn, but passing along this line here that I'm sketching right now, that would be a one. That means a material along this line would stretch such that it was doubling its length. So the deflection was equal to the length itself. And the fact that this passes through the elastomers makes sense because if you imagine taking a rubber band, you can often stretch it uh, over twice its length before perhaps it snaps. Let's discuss what the stress distribution inside our bar looks like. So here we have our bar that we're pulling on with a load P. So I'm simply pulling on it. And what we want to do is we want to ask the question is if I virtually slice this bar, what are the forces that are going to be acting on that section? So I'm going to take my bar, I'm going to cut it, and then I'm going to remove this half. And as I pull on it, I'm going to ask the question on this surface here, what are the forces or what is the state of stress that is holding this bar in equilibrium? Now, once I make my cut, I have to ask the question, now, once I make my cut, I have to ask the question, what is the stress acting on this surface? Well, our simplest approximation would be that it's just uniform. And so I have a uniform stress field here, which I'll represent as a bunch of arrows. And so I think of the stress as this distributed force, where that stress is simply the load divided by the cross-sectional area of this bar. Right, so when I take my chunk and I'm pulling on it, I'm imagining a uniform stress field on this surface. And we have reason for believing that this stress distribution across the cross section of the bar should be uniform. If you recall when we did this experiment where we took our rubber bar and we mark straight lines and then we apply a load, using rubber in this case so that we can have extreme deformation, we notice that those straight lines remain straight. We don't see, for example, that the edges move out further than the center or vice versa. If that were the case, that would denote that the strain was not uniform. But all our observations are consistent with the strain field being uniform. Therefore, by Hooke's law, stress is simply proportional to strain. We hypothesize then that this stress field is relatively uniform across the cross section and its magnitude is nothing more than the force divided by the area. So now let's quantify the effect that if I take my bar and I apply a load, not only does it get longer, but it gets skinnier. So here's my generic bar. So in the new drawing here, not only has the bar got longer, but it's got skinnier. So it's lengthened by an amount delta. So therefore the strain we say is delta over L, where L is the original length of the bar. But we have to be a little bit more precise here because we also notice there has to be a strain in this direction as well. So let's label our coordinate system called the axial direction x and the transverse direction y. So therefore, when we talk about the strain here, it's really the strain in the x direction. And therefore, there's a relationship between the strain in the x direction versus the strain in the y direction and the z direction, which would be into the page. And it's nothing more than the two are related very simply. So in this case, the strain in the y direction, we normally would define a negative sign because typical materials shrink. We give this symbol here, nu. And this constant here is called Poisson's ratio. So it ha it's a dimensionless quantity that defines, given a strain in the axial direction, what's the strain in the transverse direction. And in this case, if we had a homogeneous material, 
we would expect then that if I drew this in three dimensions, that it, we, would, we would have the same relationship between the Z dimension, which is in there. And so typical materials have a value of Poisson's ratio that we can measure. And for the most part, it ranges between zero and 0.5. It is possible to have a negative Poisson's ratio material, meaning I elongate it and the materials gets fatter. Uh, but typically we find things in this range here where even zero is rare. So material that has zero Poisson's ratio is cork. Material that has 0.5 is rubber. Now it turns out that 0.5 is the upper limit, so we don't ever find anything with greater than 0.5. Typical values for metals might be something on the order of magnitude of 0 0.3. Uh, so Poisson's ratio is really something that we have to measure and it's an experimental parameter, but it defines the relationship between the strain in the axial direction versus the strain in the transverse direction. So let's summarize everything we've learned about tension in one slide. So if I have a bar subjected to a load P, then the stress distribution across the cross section of that bar is nothing more than the load divided by the area and that stress distribution is uniform across the cross-section. Hooke's law tells us that there's a linear relationship between stress and strain, and the constant proportionality is called Young's modulus or the elastic modulus, or sometimes the modulus of elasticity. But it's a constant for a given material, and this is our assumption of a linear elastic material. There's also a relationship between the strain and the direction that we're applying the force, so the axial direction, versus the transverse direction, which is the tendency for the bar to get skinnier as we elongate it. The constant of proportionality between the axial and the transverse strains is called Poisson's ratio. So for our linear elastic material, we have two constants which we have to acquire really through experiments, so Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. Now, it's often in practice useful to apply Hooke's law using the dimensional form, which gives us the dimensional relationship between the elongation of the bar delta and these constants here, PL over EA. So P is the load, L over EA is our grouping of parameters, which is like a spring constant. So it depends not only upon the material through E, but on the geometry through its length and cross-sectional area. So everything you need to know about tension right here on one page.